obviously I'm only giving you a little bit of taste of some of the history of the ar of uh, archaeology. There are a lot of figures involved. Um, so I'm just sort of picking and choosing just to give you an idea of what was going on during the time period of culture history. Um, over on uh, our side, in uh, you know North, Central, and South America, you had explorers going into the jungles of Central America and documenting the ruins of the Maya civilization. Right? As you know, we uh, talk about much of this stuff. You know, a lot of times it's called a discovery. It's a discovery usually to people from outside that area. Um, but a lot of times in these cases, local people know about the existence, let's say, of some uh, ancient ruins. Um, so John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood, right, um, one was a lawyer. Stevens was a lawyer. Catherwood was a, a really talented artist. And this was before photography. So Catherwood's skills came in very, very useful. This was one of the earliest... Um, scientific programs to actually document Maya ruins. And so this information became available to lots of people who could uh, access the books that were published. Um, and this really started the, the beginnings of Maya archaeology. Okay, also there were some American archaeologists. Uh, so now we're moving kind of into the late 1800s, early 1900s. By now, uh, Franz Boas has set up anthropology departments, archaeology is uh, being taught in schools, and one of the groundbreaking people in scientific excavation and be making archaeology more rigorous and more scientific uh, was an archaeologist by the name of A.V. Kidder. He actually was born in Marquette, Michigan. His father was a mining engineer up there. And uh, one of the things that he uh, pioneered was systematic excavation using stratigraphy. In addition to that, he also uh, used the study of ceramics to create a chronology, right? Chronos, time, uh, logos, the study of. Basically create a sequence um, of the different pottery so that you could actually date archaeological sites in the southwest but also you could draw connections between the cultures over time right so he um you know he, he was one of the early people to realize that what he was looking at was you know a, a group of people and cultural change over time he was also able to draw similarities between the ancient populations like the anasazi who lived in the southwest and the modern populations like the hopi and the zuni uh, and, and sort of show that there was a, a, a connection between uh, these peoples and also use it in, use this, this uh, information in terms of archaeology as well. Right? So really, really important person in archaeology, especially in the United States. Uh, archaeologists after him adopted most of his methods. So his methods are, became pretty much standard uh, in archaeology. Probably the most famous archaeological find, or at least one of the top 10 most famous archaeological finds, is the tomb of Tutankhamun. This was discovered by Howard Carter, you can see pictured here, who's looking specifically for this tomb. It took him six years to finally locate the tomb of Tutankhamun. It was mostly untouched, right? That is, uh, it was essentially a perfectly preserved pharaoh's tomb, uh, which is extremely rare. Most of the ancient pharaoh's tombs were looted in ancient times. Uh, saw the tremendous wealth of this pharaoh, who was actually, in, in terms of history, not very important. So the amount of treasure that he was buried with was fabulous but was probably small compared to maybe, let's say, other pharaohs like Ramses II. But the famous death mask of Tutankhamun is maybe one of the most famous artifacts in history. Um, I won't go into too much detail about this next archaeologist, but I'd just like to mention him um, because he's an interesting figure and it, it just sort of he, he uh, 
spans the the period of the First World War and shows you what some archaeologists were actually doing in the Middle East. Right? The Carchemish excavations on the Euphrates uh, were excavated by two British archaeologists. Thomas Edward Lawrence here was a student. The main excavator was Leonard Woolley. Uh, they were there to, to excavate a Hittite city, but they were also there to keep an eye on the Germans who were building a railway uh, and a bridge across the Euphrates River. So it was a little bit of espionage work as well. This archaeologist really was fascinated by the Middle East, knew a lot about local cultures, and only a few years later when World War I broke out, he uh, was employed by the British, he was British himself, as a liaison to the Arab armies, um, and he helped lead them in battles against the Ottoman uh, Turkish army during World War I, and you might recognize him from the pictures now. This is uh, Lawrence of Arabia, right? So not many people realize Lawrence of Arabia actually started out as an archaeologist. One of his contemporaries was a really fascinating person named Gertrude Bell, who was also an archaeologist, and again, showing the the um, overlap with, with archaeology and then the other fields, she ended up becoming essentially a diplomat. She helped found the modern state of Iraq, and she also helped found the Baghdad Museum uh, in Iraq as well. So she was an archaeologist, but also a little bit of a nation builder, you might say, uh, when, when Iraq was under British control. Uh, another famous female archaeologist, Gertrude Caton Thompson, um, she worked at the ruins of Great Zimbabwe in the country of Zimbabwe in southern Africa. She had an all-female team, and uh, she proved definitively in the 20s that Great Zimbabwe was built by Native Africans, not by peoples from the outside. And she was able to do this with pottery by showing the similarity and the connections between the modern African pottery in the area and the ancient pottery from Great Zimbabwe. Okay, so the cultural history period was very, very important, obviously. But there were several archaeologists in the early 1960s uh, who said, or at least thought, we really need to move beyond uh, culture history, right? We have to move beyond just the, the who, the what, the when, the where, and the how. Right? We really have to start looking at the why. And one of the pioneers was Louis Binford. He really developed the processual or the new archaeology. And really, the, the new archaeology was founded on the idea that archaeology needed to be more scientific. Archaeology needed to ask the why questions, and it needed to do that using the scientific method. Right? All of you know what the scientific method is. All of you use the scientific method probably on a daily basis. The scientific method uses hypothesis testing, collecting data, right, um, to, in order to determine if your hypothesis is correct or incorrect. Right? So, we, you know, we're, we use the scientific method for mundane, everyday things, like why is my computer uh, working very slowly? Is it the internet or is it my uh, computer? Right? Well, if I turn off my hypothesis is that it's the internet, and to test that, I'm going to turn my Wi-Fi off and back on, and if it improves, then I could probably say, yeah, my hypothesis was correct. The modem needed to be rebooted or something like that. Um, if, you know, my hypothesis is, oh, well, my computer is working slow. If I restart it, it might actually improve it. And let's say it doesn't. You can say, well, yeah, it wasn't anything to do actually with my computer. Maybe it is something to do with the Internet. So creating hypotheses, testing those hypotheses. This is what the new archaeology is all about. It's focused on the why questions. It's focused on process of change, which is why it's usually called the processual archaeology, because it's focused on process. Right. Um, so you can set up a hypothesis 
about um, something in, hum in the human past and you can figure out, oh, if I found this, this would test my hypothesis. This would prove my hypothesis, right? So for example, uh, imagine you wanted to figure out why did ancient people go from collecting food like hunters and gatherers, only going and picking out wild food. Why did they go from that kind of lifestyle to actually agriculture, where they're taking seeds and planting them in the ground and then harvesting their crop later on? Uh, why would they go from one lifestyle to another lifestyle? You could generate a hypothesis, right? Um, pause the video for just a second and write down on your paper or think in your head, you know, why would people do that? Could I come up with a hypothesis? Okay, maybe you came up with something. Maybe you didn't. That's okay, right? But uh, sometimes I hear students say, well, maybe the population got big. People were running out of food. They had to think of a way of producing more food. That's a perfectly viable hypothesis that you could test. So what would you do? Well, you would find a site that dated to the period before and during agriculture. And you would look at the houses and let's say maybe the uh, population growth over time. If you saw a real dramatic increase in population and then the development of agriculture, that would support your hypothesis. If the population kind of remained steady, but only increased after agriculture, then that would show you that, mm, in fact, population increase doesn't really explain why they move from hunting gathering to agriculture. So this is the way processual archaeology works. And one of the first people to do processual archaeology in the Middle East was uh, Robert Braidwood, uh, who was accompanied by uh, his wife on these excavations, who was an archaeologist in her own right, and who also published books on uh, the field, on the site, right? and they actually both Braidwoods passed away on the same exact day in 2003. So they were lifelong partners to the end. Uh, the Braidwoods uh, used the new archaeology to test his hypothesis about agriculture in the Middle East. He didn't believe population increase had anything to do with it. He believed that people experimented with wild plants and animals, and over time they got better at it, and that led to agriculture. So he picked a site in northern Iraq that was where wild plants and animals grew naturally. He found an ancient site. It's you know not much left. You can see just the foundations of the walls. He found an ancient site with evidence of agriculture, and he thought that that supported his hypothesis that early remains of agriculture were found where the wild plants and animals actually grew. So that was very important. That was one of the first times, it was in the 1960s, that someone took the idea of the new archaeology and then applied it. Uh, Patty Jo Watson was a student of Robert Braidwood, and she uh, pioneered a new field, and that was archaeology in caves. She worked in Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, one of the largest cave systems in the United States, uh, and excavated Native American remains and sites within uh, Mammoth Cave. So this became a very important field within archaeology. Um, you can probably realize that uh, scientific analyses aren't going to tell you everything about an ancient society, right? And in fact, in the 1970s and the 80s, archaeologists started to push back against the new archaeology, the processual archaeology, because processual archaeologists were interested in kind of these big picture societal things, like how did agriculture emerge? But they ignored a lot about ancient people, like uh, gender, right? Not many archaeologists in the new archaeology were interested in looking at the roles of women over time and how they changed, or different ethnic groups, uh, or, or class, right? Working class and laborers and farmers in the society versus the elites or nobles. A lot of times archaeologists are more focused on the elites or, or nobles because, you know, those were the ones who were the, had the power in that society. And those were the people, let's say, that, you know, had the best looking artifacts. So people start to push back against this and they created kind of a supplement 
They thought it was a replacement at first, but it really became a, a supplement to the new archaeology called post-processualism. If someone calls their field new archaeology, you're really stuck for a name. You can't call it the new new archaeology. So post-processualism. And this, the idea behind this was that you really have to um, use other things besides the scientific method, humanities, art interpretation, things like that, in addition to the scientific method. And you need to ask questions about some of these areas that were ignored previously. So today, archaeologists use processualism and post-processualism together. Uh, you won't have a, uh, a class in archaeology where gender and class and things like that are not brought up. They're, they're, they're basic parts of the field uh, today. Elizabeth Brumfield was a very important archaeologist in post-processual archaeology. She looked at changing roles of women and the work that women did in the Aztec Empire. She used things like spinning artifacts, or artifacts used for spinning yarn, uh, because uh, during the Aztec time period, most of the weavers and spinners were women. Uh, she was able to look at numbers of spindle whorls and spinning implements and their location in the site to look at how the labor and work of women changed over time. Right. Okay, so archaeology is always changing. There's always, and there are always new discoveries being made. Uh, sometimes people get a little confused when we talk about history, right? History, as most people define it, is uh, the ancient past as described in written documents. Writing has only been around since about 5,000 years ago, right? So, you know, 3,000 B.C., um, humans have been on Earth for at least, modern humans, 100,000 to 200,000 years. Most of human history was before writing, was before history, so essentially prehistory. Archaeology is the only way you can understand prehistory because you don't have writing. So, how do you do that? Well, you're looking at, in prehistory, obviously you can't look at writing if there is no writing, but you're looking at the culture that's left behind, the things that are produced, material culture, right? So archaeology looks at the past through material culture, through the things that people built, created, and left behind. Now, how do they do this? How could you go from pieces of artifacts or, let's say, butchered bones and understand what was going on in an ancient site? Well, archaeologists use something that's known as middle range theory. I kind of think of middle range theory as the Google Translate of archaeology, right? That is, you know, if you were doing like Turkish to Russian and you know, entered the words, put in Google Translate, it spits out what it is in the other language. Uh, in middle range theory, what you're doing is you're trying to build up a base of knowledge where you're able to translate patterns of garbage, patterns of debris, things are left behind, patterns of tools, patterns of bones, and figure out what behavior produced that pattern, right? What behavior produced this garbage and this scattering of bones? How can you do that? Well, archaeologists use ethnography, the study of living people, and also experiments, Right, experimental archaeology. We'll be doing a little bit with this in a couple of weeks. So let's say by studying how people who use similar kinds of tools to people in the past, uh, how they butcher their animals and what sorts of garbage is left behind and what it looks like. Right? Does it look like what you find in an archaeological site? Well, if you build up a database where you know, okay, People butchering an animal. This is what the garbage tends to look like. Where are the animals butchered? This is the garbage uh, and what butchery looks like near to where they actually cook the animal. This is what the scattering of bones looks like in, let's say, a garbage dump after the animal is eaten. Right? If you have kind of pictures of all those different forms of scattering, 
You could then look at an archaeological site and say, okay, what was going on here? Were people butchering the animal? Were they getting ready to cook it? Were they consuming the animal? And that is important because you want to figure out what was going on at these ancient sites, right? So you're looking essentially at um, human behavior and human modification of the physical environment. That's middle range theory is the translation tool that archaeologists use to go from the ancient artifacts and debris and discover the behavior that produced those artifacts and debris. Right? Uh, one example I like to use, it's kind of a weird example, but I, I, I kind of like it because uh, I was walking in Chicago in Union Station, you know, where, where Amtrak and Metra and the other trains are. And when I was walking through Union Station, it's a station that's you know goes back to the 1800s, built of marble. It's a very beautiful building. But I looked at the steps, and I said, whoa, look at that. When you look at the steps, you see these indentations near the edges of the steps. And that's all from humans just walking up and down the steps. This is not done deliberately, right? That is, they didn't set out to make these hollowed out. It's just from the traffic, the foot traffic over time, right? So this is a little bit like middle range theory. You're looking at um, the evidence and you're trying to figure out what this means, how you can interpret it and what it tells you. And what it tells you is that people tend to use the handrails. People tend not to walk up and down the middle as much as they do on the sides. Right. Okay, so archaeologists look at material culture. A lot of the material culture that they look at is refuse, is stuff that's thrown away. It's essentially garbage. Right. So a lot of what archaeologists find is garbage, things that were thrown away, that were left behind. Um, so we're going to look a little bit at modern day garbage and how archaeologists have studied modern day garbage to kind of get an idea of how archaeology uh, works. Okay, so like we were saying, archaeologists really, when you come down to it, study garbage. They study ancient garbage. Um, but we're going to see that looking at garbage can tell us a lot. Uh, not just about ancient people, but also modern people. So archaeologists have used their techniques to look at people today and to see if we can learn anything about modern people by looking at their garbage like consumption patterns I'm going to show you some examples of this one thing though that I think is kind of uh, funny uh, you know and a little bit sort of lighthearted a little fun um, was this artist and photographer who um, made displays of celebrity trash uh, this person went through trash of several celebrities laid it out um, took photos of it and actually um, had it on display. I think it was a traveling show at one point. Um, but you could you could sort of see a little bit about the person from their garbage. Sometimes you can tell things like uh, what kind of diet they have. Uh, if you were looking at an unknown person's garbage, you might be able to figure out their approximate age, maybe their socioeconomic status, maybe their ethnicity, maybe their gender. Um, potentially all this may, could be learned from trash. So I'm going to show you some different pictures of celebrity trash and see if you could guess if the trash belongs to Holly Berry, Madonna, Steven Spielberg, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Nicolas Cage, or Ronald Reagan. He was an actor, by the way, So, besides being president. So I guess he fits into the celebrity category. Um, okay, so here's example number one, Cocoa Pebbles, Dutch Apple, lots and lots of bottled water. This is from a, like more than a decade ago anyway, so it's it's kind of outdated. If you're looking at their trash today, you'd probably see something different. Cafe Bustelo, which is a, uh, I think a Puerto Rican variety of espresso coffee. Uh, here's the next one, Hollywood Reporter. A coat hanger looks like dog food you know not not as much bottled water but coke regular coke right, here we see lots of reading material moscow circus program 
LA Times, New York Times, TV Guide, People. It's obviously this person likes to read. Um, TV Dinners. It looks like Bottles of Vinegar. Bra. Johnny Cat Kitty Litter. Diet Coke and Coke. Maybe that points to two people in the household rather than one person in the household, potentially. Uh, downy fabric softener, Windex, right? So just some of the things found in there. Here, this person threw a lot away a lot of shoes and flip-flops and slippers, including, I don't know why you would throw away SpongeBob flip-flops. Picture John Travolta, cat toys. Uh, looks like a jacket. This person's just dumping out a lot of good stuff that probably could be used again. Um, and finally, some shredded paper, maybe tax returns, who knows. Um, some other paper, a garment bag with pictures of cigars on it, Coke. Not really that much in terms of bottles. Uh, thing about, about the Oscars. So let's see who if you can figure it out. So let's take the one with the bra and the Johnny Cat first. Holly Berry, Nicholas Cage, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Madonna, Steven Spielberg, Ronald Reagan. Who do you think? It's actually Ronald Reagan, believe it or not. Okay, how about the one with all that footwear? It turns out to be Holly Berry. Okay, who's the big reader, do you think, in the group? A lot of people... With guess Schwarzenegger, but it's actually Spielberg, also big reader. Uh, this one is Arnold Schwarzenegger, with lots and lots of bottled water, Madonna, and then finally, the only one left, Nicolas Cage. Right? Okay, so you could learn about the individual, and then if you're looking at many different households, you could learn about the society. Right. So, an archaeologist at the University of Arizona named William Rathje did a garbage study in Tucson, where the University of Arizona is located. Obviously, he's not in Tucson this picture. He's standing on a huge landfill just outside of New York City. Um, and what he wanted to investigate is the consumption habits um, and see what he could learn from studying trash and people in Tucson. So he went around with graduate students and they asked people questions. And then they looked in those households trash. Uh, one thing they looked at was alcohol consumption. So they would ask people on average, how much alcohol do you consume a week? Uh, and then they would go into the trash of these households. Now, if you had to guess, do you think people un in general would underestimate, overestimate or accurately state how much alcohol they consume per week. Most people guess that they would underestimate, and that is in fact true. Um, people tend to underestimate the amount of alcohol that they're consuming. Why would that be? Well, I always think maybe it's because they're too drunk to remember, um, but it, it might have something to do with the way they want to appear to other people, the people asking the questions, that maybe they don't want to appear um, as if they drink a lot, so they deliberately downplay it, even though they may not actually be drinking a lot, but they kind of err on the side of caution. Uh, maybe they just don't remember, you know, they're not keeping track, um, but people tend to underestimate it. So one of the things that this shows us is that archaeology doesn't lie. People could lie, and people could also just not get the answer correct or not accurately state what's going on, not because they're lying, but they just don't know, right? But archaeology, the, the garbage, the things that are thrown out, doesn't lie. It will tell you what's actually going on. So this is another way it shows how archaeology is useful. Another thing they did is they looked at meat in garbage, how much meat was thrown away. And they looked at different times when meat prices went up and when meat prices went down. Now, uh, if meat prices are going up, would you expect to find more meat or less meat in the garbage? When I've asked students this question, almost all of them say you would find less because if meat prices go up, people would buy less 
and there'd be less to be thrown away. That's actually wrong. We learned something about human behavior from this. This is something that's not too surprising. You saw it during the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic, is that people panic, right? So when meat prices start to go up, people panic that the price is going to continue to go up. So they buy more meat, and the meat goes bad. Um, and they end up having to throw more of it away, actually. Right? So it's just like what we saw with people buying paper towels and toilet paper, especially toilet paper at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, why did people buy lots of toilet paper? Because they were panicking. Why were they panicking about toilet paper? Um, because uh, the news that was re reporting of, about the coronavirus and I believe China or Taiwan um, showed people buying lots of toilet paper. The reason why they were doing that is because they were worried about the supply chain coming from China. Um, there's no reason why there would be a shortage of toilet paper in the United States because of the coronavirus. There was a shortage, though, that was created by people um, stockpiling and buying huge amounts of toilet paper. Right? So people don't behave rationally in many respects right the, the game theory and theories that state that people weigh their options rationally and carefully and make the best decision um in many cases don't reflect reality people panic and people do things that are not actually in their best interest Okay, they also looked at lower income, middle income, higher income households to see if the garbage was different in these different households. Lo and behold, it was. So in lower income households, what they found, you know, what would you think the difference would be? Um, one of the things that they wanted to look at was um, generic foods versus name brand foods, right? Um, and this is something that, again, is not exactly what you expect. I, would, I always ask students, would you expect lower income people to have more generic brands or more name brands? And they always guess generic brands because generic brands seem to be cheaper, but it's actually name brands. And it's because, not because um, lower income people want the recognition of having name brand stuff is that a lot of them don't have access to generic brand stuff. Uh, a lot of them have maybe one grocery store in their neighborhood that um, doesn't necessarily carry the generic brand stuff. Whereas middle income people that, you know, uh, maybe belong to something like a, a Costco or a Sam's Club or something like that, that you know, the equivalent of that at Tucson in the 1980s, um, they had more access to those kind of cheaper generic brands. So it's counterintuitive. It's not what you expect. But this, again, shows why archaeology is important, because things that we assume to be true are not necessarily true. Um, what else did they find in lower income households? They found lots of automotive repair um, products. So, you know, empty cans of transmission fluid and oil and things like that. Lower income people tended to do their own automotive repairs rather than bring it into a shop. It was probably a way of saving money and probably a way, uh, you know, probably something they maybe enjoy doing. Um, and it was different in terms of middle income and upper income uh, people. What about middle income people? Well, I always think of that scene from old school, if you've ever seen it with Will Ferrell, where he's describing his weekend to people at a party, a college party, and he's saying he's got a busy Saturday, he's going to go to the Home Depot. Um, that's what they found a lot in middle income families. Lots of household repair stuff, empty paint cans, things like that. That's what they were uh, spending their time doing. Well, what about upper income people in Tucson? Remember, it's Tucson. Um, lots of pool supplies, right? Uh, you know, if you have the money to afford it, you probably want a pool in Tucson because it's really hot there for a good portion of the year. Uh, so this is, you know, a little wealthier community in Tucson. You could see everyone's got a backyard pool. Um, so in the wealthier families, they found more pool supplies. Uh, and so did 
um, garbage correlate with socioeconomic status. It did. That's something that we're going to see in terms of ancient people as well. That is, you might find correlations between what people are throwing away and their socioeconomic status. Another thing we're going to look at is ethnicity in the class. Well, they looked at it in Tucson as well. They compared, you know, Latino, uh, Latinx households uh, to, you know, quote unquote, Anglo households to see if there was a difference in garbage. One of the differences they noticed is just the quantity, the amount of garbage was greater in uh, Latino households. Um, the reason why that is, or the reason why that was the case, is because of uh, cooking habits, right? So if, let's say, the family was going to have Taco Tuesday, I don't know if they had that back in the 80s, probably not. Um, but if they were going to have the equivalent in Tucson, uh, in the uh, you know, Latinx family, they would make the salsa from scratch, which, you know, would generate... Um, leftover stuff from onions, uh, leftovers from uh, tomatoes, you know, leftovers from other things that are going into the salsa. An Anglo family might just open up a jar of salsa and say, here, dinner's served. Um, and so all they're throwing away is the, is the jar, right? So our garbage in that respect seemed to correlate also with ethnicity. Um, William Rathje uh, you can see spent some time excavating landfills like you would a tell or an archaeological site. And one thing they know is that just like in a tell, the instead of pottery, cans will actually help you date the layers, right? So you can see here, these are tops of beer cans. There's a you know different technology through time in terms of how you opened it, you know, so back in, you know, what is this, the, you know, the 1950s, and you're in the 1950s, and you wanted to open up a can of beer, you'd had to take that little can opener with the point on it, and make two, two holes, one to drink out of, and one for the air to go in, you know, by the 1960s, 1970s, you had pull tabs, right? We actually had to pull this off, and then you, of course, threw that on the ground or in the garbage where it ended up in the landfill. All these different pull tabs can be uh, identified in terms of what, you know, brand they're from. That's one thing where, uh, or one way that Rathsey was behaving like an archaeologist, even though he was looking at modern debris. But also the types of cans that are found in the different levels help you date the levels. So if you're digging in a level that has, uh, let's say, these kinds of, of, you know, I forgot what these are now called, now these little flip tabs, right? You could say, oh, yeah, I know them at least. It's 1975 to recent times that time period right so you can date the layers using that just like you would an archaeological site now we throw away a lot of garbage not surprisingly i mean things are changing slowly things are even changing on campus there's more compost bins and things like that um you know it, it our attitude towards garbage which is much more cavalier you know 50 years ago 40 years ago we just threw stuff away and didn't think twice about it. We're a little bit more cognizant today in terms of recycling, but we still have a ways to go. But just to give you an idea, this is one of the largest structures in the New World. It's the Pyramid of the Sun. It is 75 million cubic feet. You can see the little people here for scale. There is a landfill in San Francisco, the Durham Road Landfill, that is double the volume of this enormous pyramid. It is 150 million cubic feet. And that's just one landfill in San Francisco. So we are throwing a lot of things away. So the other thing that Rathji wanted to see is uh, what is in the landfill? What are people throwing away? So um, circa 1980, what would people, th what would you think would be in landfill? Right? Uh, some people say acid wash jeans. Right, wham tapes. Um, this is what a lot of people thought. They thought the majority of the fill would be disposable diapers, plastic bottles, large appliances, maybe a little newspaper, maybe office paper, food and yard waste, a little bit, 
no one even mentioned construction debris when they actually looked at what was in the landfill. Right? Disposable diapers, plastic bottles, large appliances, in terms of volume was negligible. Paper was a huge amount in 1980. And there was lots of construction debris. When you tear a house down, you cannot recycle everything. A lot of it is just going to end up th thrown away in the landfill. Um, and so this tells us a little bit about our consumption patterns. Right? Um, in the next slide, I'm going to show you a little video about RathG, um, where he, they kind of profile the garbage project. And then we're going to uh, wrap up and just kind of mention another sort of, I think, fun way to think about archaeology and how archaeologists uh, look at the past. And that will be the end for this week's uh, material. I will also uh, be posting instructions on the little lab project that you're going to work on over the weekend for uh, f so that you have it prepared for Monday. I'm an archaeologist, so I was trained to learn about ancient societies by digging up, sorting through, and analyzing ancient garbage. Professor Bill Rathje isn't just talking trash, he's digging it. We're trying to look at today's society the way an archaeologist will in a thousand years without waiting that long. All of the daily aspects of our lives what we eat, how we clean, how we have a good time. It's all buried in here. People think I'm nuts. This is the heart and pulse of America, right here. Nowhere else. This is where it all ends up. Feeling that heartbeat is why Rath G helped start the University of Arizona's garbage project in 1973. These garbologists perform large-scale excavations at landfills across the country. A special machine is used to bore down 100 feet into the trash heap to pull out piles of old garbage. Team members sort and sift through the waste, bag it, tag it, then categorize it. The weight is 16 ounces solid. Brand is armor. The deeper the digging, the older the trash. It'd be nice if we could get a good date right off. Coupon void after October 13th, 1963. We're getting a good cross section of what's in the landfill so that we can get a good idea of what was thrown in when and what's happening to it. You might expect food products to break down and magically disappear. Rubbish, says Rathji. A lot of people believe when you throw paper and food debris and yard waste into a landfill, it will biodegrade and disappear. And that just doesn't happen. Food debris and yard waste, about 50% of it will biodegrade in the first 15 years. And then it stabilizes. But the rest of the garbage that makes up a landfill isn't going anywhere for a very long time. As far as we know, there's no real significant difference in how long it's going to take paper or styrofoam or plastic of any kind to decompose. A lot of people think that landfills are being filled up by fast food packaging, styrofoam, and disposable diapers. But paper is a recyclable material, yet it accounts for 16 times more volume than the total amount of those so-called environmental bad guys. Translation, too much paper is being trashed. One of the most interesting things to me is that when you study the packaging and the food remains and the recyclables at a landfill, it tells you a different story about us than when you ask people what they eat and drink, what they recycle, what they throw away. And that's because we like to think that we're recycling everything. We like to think that we're doing the right things. You get the reality here at a landfill. And the reality is we need to do a better job recycling. The phone book. Look at this, the archeological record of a lost civilization. Lost? Not yet. These remnants tell the tale not only where we've been, but also where we're headed. 
we're in what archaeologists call a classic period. That means we're at, we're at our peak. Everything's going great for us. Resources are pouring in, and we're wasting them at an incredible rate. Sooner or later, the resources dry up, and eventually they collapse. This is not a gloom and doom perspective. This is a perspective based on studying hundreds of civilizations that have come before us. They've all gone through the same cycle. We should definitely learn from the past. We can make our cycle better and more fun to be in by knowing a lot about how to create less garbage. It's easy to poke fun at archaeologists. Uh, sometimes archaeologists deserve it, I think. Um, a, a kind of a, a, a funny little way that uh, a famous author, David McCauley, uh, poked fun at archaeologists was with his book, Motel the Mysteries, where it's an archaeologist in the future uh, excavating uh, a site from our time period. So looking at the overhead aerial view of the site he interpret the future archaeologist interprets this pattern as the landing strips for extraterrestrials um, and then the monuments for the different colored religious sects that existed during this time period falls down a shaft ends up uh, in front of a door which Howard Carson, take off on Howard Carter, discoverer of King Tut's tomb, uh, believes is an ancient tomb with a sacred seal on the door. You can see the sacred seal right here. The uh, sacred eye to ward off evil spirits. Uh, the containers in which the sacrificial meal was offered to the gods. Opens up the door to the tomb. You can see this is taken just from those pictures of Tut's tomb I showed you before. And inside is the deceased laid out. You can see here facing the great altar. Uh, in his hands was the sacred communicator. Uh, a vessel labeled ICE was there for the internal organs of the deceased. Then broke down the burial chamber and inside was another uh, deceased person interned in the white sarcophagus with ceremonial markings on the bottom and then the music box located on the sacred urn this is how Howard Carson interpreted the sacred collar and headband used in ancient times you can see the necklace here and you should remember or hopefully you remember this is a spoof of the picture of Heinrich Schliemann's wife who is wearing the gold from Troy and the ritual chant into the sacred urn he turns out it was part of the Tutankhamun motel and then of course the artifacts that were then displayed and the great altar for the gods movie A and movie B so a little bit of I think kind of lighthearted fun um, what we're going to be looking at next week is uh, getting into some of the uh, interpretations that we can make of different sites. Um, and also we're going to look at a specific dating technique. You guys will be working on a lab looking at gravestones from Marblehead uh, online. And you will be doing an analysis of that. And we will be talking about what we can use that for. Uh, next week. So have a good rest of your week. Please let me know if you have any questions um, and I will talk to you all very soon.